Welcome to Overlanding from Home. My name is Anton. I'm an avid overlander, lover of nature, and humanitarian by heart. The past while, I've always been interested in the outdoors, and I want to hear about other people's experiences and their rigs. Yes, the big rigs, the small rigs, everything they've done to design them and how they plan it. I hope you enjoy listening. Let's find out who today's guest is. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks again for signing in and listening to these uh, very cool podcasts uh, at the moment. Um, it's been going really nicely. It's been a bit quiet, but I've got a few nice ones lined up, much like today. So Overlanding from Home brings today um, a wonderful chap, um, he, a, a great story, super excited to hear what's going on. Um, his Instagram handle is Kaya on Wheels. Kaya means house in Zulu. And uh, it's uh, um, yeah, it's really really exciting to chat. And I want to introduce Martin uh, Martin. Is that right? Uh, close uh, enough. Just to get it right. Yeah, uh, it's close enough. It's, yes, sorry. It makes it a bit interesting. It's Martin, uh, the Dutch way, but Martin is the easy uh, easy version. Martin. Okay, Martin van der Putsch, which is the full details. But all yes, those details right. will be put. All those details will be put down below for you to follow anyone that's around. So, so listen, you know, um, Martin, thank you very much. I'm really excited to hear about you because you've been doing some, some you've kind of nailed the overlanding uh, sus sustainability way on a, on a different way that I think I've come across. Um, there's been one other um, wonderful guy, Ferenc, from um, Hungary that has actually put together a way of trying to make money while, or still earn, an, earn a living from a company while overlanding and being out of an office. And you've, you've really nailed that in a completely different way. So, so let's just get, let's get the ball rolling. I mean, obviously I'm going to talk about your rig and stories and things like that, but you, you, you obviously moved. Um, you told me to, it was the Eastern Cape, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I'm Dutch uh, right. originally, but I moved to South Africa 15 years ago with my uh, then partner and our children. And we uh, moved to the Eastern Cape in South Africa, Port Elizabeth, where uh, yeah, we, uh, we had a great life. And I loved my 4 by 4 ing and the weekends and the Bavians and uh, the Transkei, all the beautiful places in that area. Um, I've really uh, explored extensively. Um, but a long-term overland journey was something that I always dreamt of. Um, and that uh, started two and a half years ago in February 2018. I left and I started driving without a uh, destination, without a time limit. Um, so no rush. Uh, very slowly, actually, in a way where I feel I could sustain this um, instead of rushing through Africa, taking yes. all the boxes and going from national park to national park, like unfortunately most people do it, or fortunately, I mean, that's just yes, the way yes. others do it. And I used to do this, do the same thing. Um, you drive long, long days to get somewhere. The, the getting somewhere became the, the real journey and not the destinations that you plan to go to. Um, and that, uh, yeah, changed the whole dynamic of my journey over the last couple of years uh, into yeah, more of a, a, a lifestyle instead of just a year off or a trip for a year or six true, months. True, And I think, I think you know, I, I, I just want to compliment what you're saying is that when looking at your photos, there is no sense of urgency and you, and you capture what's happening at the time, you know, which I think is really, really cool. And it's, and you're right, you know, you've kind of got stuck in with the local communities and and you can see that and you've really enjoyed the 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 getting there and hanging out type of vibe instead of getting there to leave which is unfortunately what 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 most people tend to do yeah i think um for me as well the challenge of this financial part of a journey um i have a little bit of income that i secured uh through my previous uh, businesses uh, yes. it's not much but uh, a couple of hundred US dollars a month um, can take you a long way if you slow down. If you, uh, I, my philosophy is not making more money, but actually reducing my need for money. So the cheaper I live, the wealthier yes. I am. Uh, and then, and then, I mean, at the moment, I'm living in Uganda on, on a 
well, what's it, 3,000 Rand, $150 a month uh, comfortably. Um, it's just about making certain choices and um, I don't go out for dinner. I don't indulge in, in too much uh, alcohol, which is an yes. expensive one. Um, I, I believe in wild camping. I don't have to pay to stand in somebody's yard with a broken toilet and a leaky, yeah. crappy shower. I can just park it in the bush. Um, it's all about changing your feeling of what is safe and what's, what is not safe. And um, uh, my experience is that it's a lot safer to just park it in the bush somewhere for the night than to stand in some overcrowded uh, overland campsite where you get yeah, woken up at 5 a.m. in the morning because of your neighbors uh, and you pay $10 a night for it. Um, so I've changed, I, I changed my way of what, what yeah. I need, you know? Um, and, and I need to be safe and comfortable, but I've never had any negative experiences um, with people in Africa. I think, I think so, to um, in, in, interrupt there, it's like most people have this perception. I mean, I did a, a Instagram live chat with a, a wonderful um, overlander from Kuwait. Um, his name's Jamal. And, um, uh, you know, d during the live chat, uh, he had people asking questions that were, how safe is Africa? And they've heard this and they wondered about that. And, you know, people listen and say, everyone's seen what happened in Rwanda, what, 25 years ago. And yet to this day, it's still mm -hmm. being brought up. And, you know, if anyone's been to Rwanda, yep. it is like the most safest, coolest, chilled country ever. Kigali is as low-key as it gets. The streets are cleaner than they are in Cape Town. You get internet all over the place. So it's, it's a very different concept of what perception is. And I, I think you're right. If, you, if you're hanging around in, in the hotspots, which is generally in your urban areas, you know, you need to be a little bit more mindful than when you're out in the bush, which is what you're doing. And I think something that you made a comment to me when we chatted a few weeks ago was very interesting, is that you you do also work, uh, do woodwork at certain places, which helps you, I, I, I would guess, either financially a little bit, or at least a good place to stay with a clean shower or something like that, you know. I, I'm, I'm obviously, yeah. in your vehicle, your vehicle's called Bertha, correct? Right. Uh, my daughter, uh, who lives in Cape Town, uh, a teenager, she called it, she named it Big Bertha, and um, that stuck. So, um, yeah, it's not just the car for me, it's really my home. Yes. It's a little house on wheels, and I've equipped it and kitted it out as such. So, um, I put up curtains, I painted it, I hung up photo frames, I made it into a very small home. But uh, with comfort, and that includes for me having my tools. So I'm a carpenter or handyman, and I um, yeah I have solar and an inverter. So all my battery operated tools, my jigsaw, grinder, um, drill, I can charge in my car. So anywhere I go, I have power tools to actually um, do things that I enjoy to do, and that's woodwork or fixing things and just general maintenance. And I. Uh, yeah, instead of um, going in at certain places and asking how much it is to stay, I uh, go in with the idea of I have something to yes. offer. I'm not just coming to pay as the guest. Um, and I can do something, something you need uh, that is worth more than my 5 or $10 yes, a night. Yes. Um, in, yeah, and that can create incredible situations like Monkey Bay in Malawi. I stayed for three weeks and um after three weeks they owed me money yeah. instead of uh, that i had to pay it was lovely <laughs> but you know i've got goosebumps because Martin, that is like that is so it's 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 gnarly for lack of of a, of a better term if, if, if you're a surfer now i i i can i completely that appeals to me and i i in 1999 i hitchhiked to america and canada and um I used to stay in, in the youth hostels, but I used to work in them. And if you work for three hours um, a day, cleaning the rooms, mopping the floors, doing the dishes, it didn't matter. You get your bed that night for free. And I stayed in San Diego, for example, for three months. Um, I, I got kicked out of a few uh, uh, b, &B, um, b, &B uh, out of a few hostels because of either being naughty or, or, or just too much booze. But it was, it was appealing in the sense that I could work uh, during the day, uh, in the morning, get, get the cleaning and everything out the way, then go and work on the yachts, 
uh, and earn and earn some money for food, and then do the same thing the next day. You know, it was fantastic. And I, so what you're doing is really appealing, and it's sustainable. You can keep doing it. I mean, with this, with a good solar panel charging your your batteries, you can do pretty much anything anywhere. And I think that's just a a fantastic way to keep going. And, I, and I, now let's just talk about big big Bertha quickly. She's yeah. she's uh, a Toyota. What year is she? She looks like a. Uh, she's an old. La- she's an old lady. She's a 1986 uh, Hilux number one. Wow. So um, she's a, a sturdy ride, but it's a customized um, built. It's, there's only one of them in the world. Uh, there was a company called Reco Camper Vans in Limpopo in South Africa that built custom made camper vans. It doesn't exist anymore, but. Uh, I was lucky to find this vehicle in Cape Town, and I kitted it out. But it's in a it's an old car, um, so it's a sturdy ride. It's not always that comfortable compared to fancy rigs, uh, new cars. But there's no electronics. I can fix yes. it myself. I've been broken down in the middle of the bush, and you can find a piece of wire or a bolt on the side of the road, and you can actually keep going. Um, and I've um, yeah, the interesting concept is that some people have shaken their heads and they look at your car and they're like you can't go to africa with that you can't go to the central kalahari um and i like to prove i, I prove yes. them wrong that um, you can't buy off insecurity you could try and throw all your money at the fanciest newest land cruiser with all the trimmings and the gadgets but you're still gonna get stuck like everybody else you still have a broken axle or something else that's will stop you in your tracks and that will create another aspect of overlanding which people try to avoid but i actually feel is yeah a, a part that really brings memories you know it's the breakdowns and the people that help me the moments that you think like oh what am i going to do where am i going to sleep tonight you know what we'll sleep right here on the side yeah. of the road uh, and and those are really the highlights in the end instead of breezing flowing uh, through africa and uh, having it so easy, that's great, but that's a holiday. Correct. Overlanding is about challenges, and it's about overcoming them and learning. I, I knew nothing about cars. Now I can fix my own car. If it doesn't start, I know what to do uh, and how to eliminate the problems it could be to find what the, the problem is. And um, I'm, I'm yeah, actually quite happy that I don't have a fancy brand new yeah. car, but an old a uh, lady that uh, needs my attention and some TLC at times. Um, every big city is always a stop at some mechanic to fix something. But um, yeah, that's that's how I chose to do it. And um, you can travel Africa like that. I mean, as you know, there's people doing it in normal cars, people hitchhiking, people walking it. So um, it's really up to everybody who, who wants adventure to see how, how big I completely they want agree it. with you you know I, um, it, it's just so many people throw 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 money at their vehicles and you know they they want certain comforts and things like that which is perfectly fine there's nothing wrong with that um, everyone's got their own quirkiness I've um, I've now bought a heated blanket that I plug into my vehicle for my rooftop tent because it's cold at night it's winter mm. why must it's i nice. why must i sleep uh cold you know it, 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 it doesn't make sense so there's nothing wrong with uh, having it i think i think i i actually say this every every uh, podcast is no good story ever ever started off with when i went to the kitchen to boil the water for um to boil the kettle for uh, for some water you know um i, I think it just it shows that Guys like you and and most overlanders, they 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 shouldn't be a rush. And I think that's the difference with your vehicle. You're not going to push your vehicle overboard. Um, you you're going to choose a end destination, and the road will determine your speed. Firstly, um, especially in Africa, because not every road is fantastic. Um, but also, if you if if you're in a place where you are like now. Um, there's there's no rush to get somewhere because you are s- sustaining a living without having to um, prove a point in in all the ticks and boxes that that other people are trying to achieve when they do go overlanding. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I just don't have that kind of budget as well. So for me, it was like, okay, either I go like most go, they go for a year, fancy car, all the trimmings, national park to national park. 
spending a lot of money on the way and then overlanding is yes. is expensive and not uh, for everybody but um, i wanted to do it in another way and that is by working my way through africa helping on a farm for three months working in a backpackers doing some maintenance here reducing my financial need slowing down so i don't need to put a lot of petrol in the car I mean, uh, it took me two and a half years to get to Uganda, which other people do in two it's weeks. Crazy! Sometimes. I mean, crazy uh, on both sides. Two and a half so, years is is yeah. already pretty pretty hectic. I mean, uh, looking at your at your vehicle, I'm looking at a photo here where uh, it's in a workshop in Da, and uh, yeah. obviously it, it 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 was either break or diff uh, related, but. It's 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 a great looking vehicle. You've got lights all over the place. You've got uh, what two three windows, two on the side, one at the back, big window. Um, you've got a high lift jack. Have you used the high lift jack before? I have, I have, but um, yeah, it wasn't working properly, so it was quite a challenge. Uh, but I had to get myself out of the salt pans at Makhari Khadi okay. in Botswana, uh, where I got uh, stuck up to my sump everything in, in black mud so i uh yeah had a good day of digging before i got myself out uh, one of those moments again yes <laughs> yeah, it's um it's it's a camper van so the the roof goes up and i've got uh i've got put that uh, most overlanders don't have and i've met quite a few over the over the years of course and uh, i used to have a rooftop tent myself so it means packing in and packing out and uh, i just park yes. it i pop the roof which is one minute and i'm basically done um, and it sleeps three people a full double bed a full single bed it's got a kitchen uh, i've got a nice fridge freezer uh, my inverter provides me with all the electricity i need so it's um yeah except for bathroom facilities it has everything True. that a normal house would offer me as well it's just small um and it's it's quite comfortable minimalism to, uh, to live in a shoebox you know actually. i'm sorry to interrupt um, but minimalism is definitely world. um becoming a big thing and it's and, uh -huh. and it, it it is for 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 me i mean every six months i go through my vehicle and i'm going did i use it no do i need it so there might be that one time that i do need it then then i will take it but you know i i, I sit sometimes chatting yeah. with some people that that uh, reach out to me directly about packing their vehicles and um and uh, organizing it and the one guy said no you know he's going away for a month and he wants to take uh, three four four and a half kg gas bottles and i said why do you want three i said how many times do you boil water oh maybe three times a day okay mm. so are you going to do fires at night or cook on a gas no, I'll probably do mostly fires. I said, there alone, you're going to use one gas bottle in two months. So, you know, and it just it just goes goes to show that that, you know, when yeah. you when you realize what you need and, and 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 what you don't need, it's actually a nice relief to just give it away. I mean, how many t-shirts can we wear at once? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Very true. Very true. If you have the space. You bring a lot more than you sometimes need, but um, yeah, I quite enjoy the fact that I have a similar yeah, yeah, I'm listening. To a normal house. I, I uh, have come very in very handy over the years uh, on different moments, even helping others out that uh, just need that yes. one bolt and that one uh, nut, and, and, and you have it. So I never skimped on all the the extras, the spare water pump, the spare fuel filters, yes, and yes. all the bits and pieces. So actually you can do your maintenance yourself. Um, or, or in a garage, you can yeah, provide yeah. all the, the parts for people to, to fix your car. Besides your special tools, uh, obviously you've just got normal uh, general tools that are used for mechanics and things like that. Um, do you, do you, how many big spare parts do you generally carry? Um, I have uh, everything to service the car um, and an uh, extra fuel pump, water pump. So what I did before I left, I actually replaced, replaced everything I could. And the spares that were still working, I kept as extras. So I put everything new in and then I kept the, what came off the car um, and brought with me as spares. And that, um, yeah, I've yes, come yes. in quite handy. I mean, fan belts, things like that, the obvious 
to be able to uh, do the small stuff. And that's that's basically it. I mean, the cool thing about this kind of car is that everywhere in Africa, in the smallest village, they know how to fix it. It's a Hilux without electronics, so it can be fixed everywhere. Um, and and yeah, that that is actually a huge advantage if I compare it to new cars with computers and electric systems. If you break down and you have a problem, you need a laptop. Not well, going to happen. I mean, try and find that <laughs> when you're somewhere in the middle of uh, Zambia. Um, no, then you need you need to wait for two days for a truck to come and pick you up. And I've seen it. I've seen people with their brand new cars on a flatbed being towed back to Lusaka, losing a week of their short holiday already, just because they have yes. a car that needs so much attention when something goes wrong. So um, I strongly believe in uh, avoiding that kind of risk and rather have a little bit of an older car without all that uh, risk if you really want to go into far off places. Um, and yeah, I, I, I always did. The Central Kalahari where most say you need satellite light phones and at least two yeah. cars. I went by myself, spent a week there. Um, and, and yeah, if I broke down, I, I would have broken down, but I knew that I could survive for a week by bringing enough water and food and spare parts that yes, if somebody, yes. when somebody would find me, I would be fine again. Um, so yeah, it's the preparation, a big part is a mental thing as well. And being ready for what some call disaster or a huge setback, it can be actually the best part of, of your journey. Those moments when you're so challenged that you don't know what to do and that you have to find help and rely on the kindness of strangers and people that help will help you. Everywhere in Africa, you will be helped. People come out of the bushes. I completely and agree with you. you know, there's, I've, I've never be ever been let down anywhere. In fact, more more in the city areas in South Africa than I have out in the bush. And uh, I, I've been very fortunate and, and mm -hmm. very lucky. But I also, you know, I drive a Defender 110. I've got a 2.4 Ford motor in there, which is uh, which is standard. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a fairly simplistic engine to fix you know maybe not as simple as yours but a lot simpler than some of these other ones that, that are yep. out there and i had a i had a guy put um petrol in my diesel on the way home from my humanitarian work last year so i know i know all about being stuck on the side of the road with no one around and uh, um and and just being able to figure it out it was it was it was pretty awesome you know it was a it, it's obviously not a great experience at the time but uh, when you when you sit back and you look at it now, you can just go, you know what? I actually, no. what what did I learn? I learned a new and I learned a new way to fix my my engine and put uh, uh, diesel back in, you know, without there being too much drama. So I think you're right. You know, all of those experiences, which is what overlanding is 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 about. It's not the Chinese climbing off a bus, taking a photo, getting back on, and moving to the next town. You know, and I think people people that that rush it shouldn't do it. I've been having a chat to uh, um, uh, uh, another guy that I've been, that I did a podcast with from uh, um, Oman. And, he, you know, he was, I, he said to me, you know, he needs to look at, at, at how far he can go. And I said, no, look at your timelines. You don't, don't rush it. If you do 400 kilometers in a, in a day, count your blessings. I did, I, it took us, uh, nine and a half hours yeah. to do 220 kilometers last year because the road was so bad. So, you know, I know what it's like with the roads in uh, Africa. People look at it and they go, oh, but it's only 220 kilometers. You know, you can do that in two hours. I'm like, no, dude. <laughs> no. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you, you miss so much on the way as well. I mean, uh, people ru rush through Africa from park to park. But there's so much in between and the remote areas where there's maybe no national parks to go to, but there's natural wild wilderness and uh, vegetation and animals. And I mean, the local communities are really like the, the part of the people of Africa as well. And not just the national parks to see the next big, big five game. I mean, I love that as well, but that, that comes with the price tag as, as, as well. That's park Easy. fees and conservation Easy. fees. Easy. I mean, just to go to Ngora Gora or um, one of the Kenyan um, uh, national parks, uh, you're looking at $80 oof. a person as a foreigner. 
as a local, you pay next to nothing. But as a foreigner, they target us, which really makes me angry yeah. because, you know, it, it should be equal for all. But no, they just believe in in making it uh, hectic. I mean, for, for me to go with my wife um, and my daughter, who at the time was three, uh, into Old Pajetta National um, um, Private Reserve was $80. And that's a rate set by the government. And that, sorry, that was $80 per person. Sorry. I know, it's still cheap. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean the Serengeti in Goro Goro Crater, just the car permit is $285, I think, to drive your own foreign licensed car into the Serengeti. And then you haven't even camped and you haven't paid conservation fees or anything. So you're looking at, I mean, I understand why they do it because it, uh, it looks like they discriminate for the self. Uh, drive overlanders uh, I mean I parked my car in Arusha and I got onto a uh, shared uh, safari vehicle with an operator that did it so much cheaper than I could have done it myself and I uh, I went through the parks like that not with my own car I left that and I found a cheaper option e as much as I could yes uh, because I really wanted to see those those parked um, so you sometimes have to adapt a little bit and let go of the idea. I need my car. I want to do it myself. Well, then, then, then bring your gold Trade it off. <laughs> and your diamonds because it's going to cost you. Um, yeah. But otherwise, sometimes you just need to, like Zanzibar, leave your car in Dar es Salaam, go to Zanzibar, spend a week, come back. Some people insist on having their car and they want to ship it and they go through all these troubles and massive costs just because they can't let go of the idea that sometimes you need to let go of your car. Yeah, you know, it's, I think that's, I think it goes back to our discussion or our comments earlier about people not, not able, to, not able to let go. You know, they have to carry all those special things. I mean, I was thinking about it literally this morning, not knowing I was going to have this uh, chat with you, but when I go on my uh, humanitarian work and we go between places, I carry two lenses uh, which is a, a close uh, 10 to 18 lens. And I carry, uh, I think it's a 300 to 600 lens. That's it. I don't need special lenses in between. I don't need anything else. That's all I carry. And, and it just makes close or far, you know, I don't need to carry five different lenses, which, which makes me then have a special um, Pelican or one of those other vault, um, you know, cases because it's all space. You know, for me, I have a lot less space than what you have, a lot less. So it's just it's crazy, man. I, I'm I it's I, I see some people that just that just go mad when they they just walk through a camping shop and they'll have I have this, I'll have two of those, I'll have one of those. How many pots do you need to cook in? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, good, good uh, cast iron, black pot for on the fire can take you yes. anywhere. You can bake and fry and do whatever you want with that. Um, but yeah, it's 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 tempting. The gadgets are being uh, is a part of the the overlanding lifestyle, especially in South Africa. I think Australia is very similar, and the and, and the states where um, there's so many gadgets, there's so many cool things that uh, can make life a little bit easier, and they do. I used to love it as well, um, but um, it yeah, didn't make sense anymore doing it as I'm doing now, where I've slowed down, yes. where it's more about the journey than the destination, um, and, and there's no real end goal, you know? I mean, uh, Namibia, I think I've yes. circled it three times, uh, not because I wanted to, but, but because I just randomly like decided you know what, let me go back to Windhoek for a little bit. And then uh, I went back there. And, I, you know, you just change your plan on the way. Um, it doesn't really matter. I mean, if you sleep, you got your eyes closed. So wherever you are, it doesn't really change the way you sleep. It's just your own illusion of I needed to be there. Otherwise, we don't make our time frame. And that pressure, I yeah. feel, takes away yeah. a lot. Yeah, from I, the I do agree. And, you know, I think... Mean, you are very fortunate where you don't have the um, the time limitations that most of us do. You know, uh, obviously for you, can you hear me? Oh, I know. Um, so yeah, yeah. I uh, you know it it, yeah. it does help, I'm and I'm I think very are you so yeah. so 
which countries have you traveled? Obviously, in Namibia, you've done Botswana. Have you done up north around uh, the Delta in, in Botswana and some of them? Yeah, I um, <clears throat> I started at Port Elizabeth, first to Transkei, the wild coast in South Africa, and along the Western Cape, uh, up to a big event that I always go to, Africa Burn. Um, so I spent uh, 10 days there. Then I went into Namibia, uh, Botswana, Zimbabwe, um, which I really yes. enjoyed, actually. Unfortunately, now it's a bit challenging, but even then, people were advising me, don't go to Zimbabwe, it's not safe. And I, I spent, what, I think 10 weeks there. I've not experienced one moment of all of those stories that people throw at you because 10 years ago they had to pay some police officer a bribe. There's none of that. Yeah. Really, people are warm and welcoming. I love Zimbabwe. Um, and most overlanders yeah. avoid it because of the stories they've heard. Don't believe the stories. Listen to them. Take it serious, but make up your own mind. Um, and I went into Zambia, then Malawi, back to Zambia, and into Tanzania. Do, are you going to Rwanda, settle in uh, Uganda? Because I know you've been there for a bit, and uh, you commented to me the other day that uh, you may uh, invest a little bit there. I mean, is it something that you're taking a little bit more seriously? Well, yeah. I mean, looking at the options I have as well, um, I left South Africa. Okay. I don't feel um, that's my home anymore. Um, it's where I used to live. But um, the current situation, borders being closed, the fear, the insecurity of what the future is bringing, and maybe the rest of the world is going on with life and booking holidays to France. Like my family in Holland, they, they, their yes. life has gone on as, as if nothing happened. But in Africa... We will have a lot more time. We need a lot more time to actually deal with this crisis. Uh, Uganda is on lockdown. There's a curfew. The borders are closed. I don't see a change very soon. Uh, and if it does, do I want to put myself through uh, all that insecurity and stress of traveling in a time when people are yeah. not that welcoming to foreigners and strangers? Unfortunately, that's a reality at the moment as well. Every Mzungu, every white person... Uh, brings that's right. corona. That's the idea people have. It's the outsiders. So if you travel and you pass through a village and people are shooing you away, then it doesn't feel right. It, it's not a good time to consider overlanding, in my opinion. Uh, it's taking a risk that I don't want to take. So therefore, the best I can do is to stay put for a while and to uh, maybe give it a year and see what happens. Uh, if I can drive okay. back to South Africa, my initial plan was to drive to Europe and to um, yeah, make it uh, to Europe one day. But I don't know if that's possible with this situation and what the future is giving us. Everything is uh, unsure. So maybe settling down and uh, creating a little home for myself very cheaply. Um, could give I think, me, you know, uh, I think this I whole thing is, is definitely is going now. to calm down. Uh, I, I know that uh, it's been commented to me that in February, the borders will open comfortably uh, from South Africa. And then when that happens, most of the bordering countries will, it'll be one of two things. They're going to go and do the same uh, or they're going to go, hang on, there's too many cases in South Africa. We're going to keep our borders closed like Namibia and Botswana. And I read a brief article the other day where um, Namibia and Botswana, I think, I think Botswana, but Namibia are allowing certain flights in from Europe. So not not from South Africa, they're allowing it direct. Yeah. Which means, you know, if you come from SA, it's a it's a it's a flag. Um that's that that can't work. Um but it is definitely uh going to lighten up and, and I think people are gonna chill and uh, you know, who wants to personally who wants to live in cities all the time anyway? I mean, when you've been out in the bush and you've you've managed to um, see the elephants walking past you and hear the lions roaring, you know, like a, what sounds like two meters away, but it's five kilometers. Um, it makes a very different perspective about life. And, you know, my when I used to have a Golf 6 TSI before I got the Defender, my lifestyle has completely changed just because of what I'm doing now with the overlanding. Completely changed. Um, I'm not in a rush to get anywhere anymore. Uh, I, I'm a lot more relaxed when I get there, you know, I don't get there and having to rush and get things organized and done. And I think that makes a huge difference 
Um, j- just in the sense that living in a city, you literally are in a rush. When, you, when you're when out where you are, there is no big rush. As long as you got water, you got some food, and you can cook, and, and you're warm at night, and obviously being warm and dry is a, is a, is a big deal, and, and you definitely have that. And you get torrential rains in Uganda, where it becomes a very different level. Um, I think I think people need need that, um, and if they can do similar to what you're doing, and I think you can definitely educate people by saying, you know, go and go and give back to the community by by investing in them, and that's what they see, which is why you're able to do the woodwork where you go, because not many people can rock up with the with the cordless tools that you have. I mean, I've just, I, and I understand that because I've just, during the first lockdown, I went and bought a whole bunch of cordless tools, a circular saw, um, a, um, a grinder, a better jigsaw, all cordless, because it just makes so much more sense. Yeah, and it gives you uh, new opportunities. I mean, um, yeah, it's easy to spend money. Let's get real. That's what we... Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm listening. It's true. Yeah, I'm listening. It's true. Are you still there? Yeah. Ah, sorry. Um, It's easy to spend money. A lot of people say uh, we're we're supporting the local community. And I I get that. But it also creates the ugly side of what we experience in Africa, where children uh, follow the car screaming, sweet, sweet, sweets. Give me money. Give me money. Is English they know. Because people do stop and give money and sweets. And, and, and I would really, Correct. just as a side note, but discourage any overlander to do that. It ruins, Correct. it creates beggars. It creates people. No, but it's so nice for the children. It's not nice for the children. They didn't grow up in your hometown. They're not raised with sweets and McDonald's. They have a different kind of reality. So for you to come and spoil their reality with your idea of what children need, it actually damages more then you do good and, and rather stop and talk and help people without that money aspect. It's so easy to give money or to uh, all these stories about some Zimbabwean or Malawian kid that you're going to sponsor for their, their schooling for the next three years. It's all great and well meant, but it doesn't yes. make any real difference. It just creates a lot of youngsters that are overeducated in a country where there's no jobs expecting jobs. It, it, it doesn't empower them. It uh, just creates more of what we see, what I see in Africa, and these, these outsiders dictating what people need to be happy, um, while often they themselves don't really find happiness in all that material stuff. So, yeah, I've experienced that in many places in Africa, the, the ugliness of what tourism and overlanding can bring where money is seemingly the only thing you can offer. And you have more to offer than that. You can help people with many different things just by sharing your knowledge and your experiences, um, by linking them to somebody else, to using your network, to, um, yeah, to look beyond that easy fix of here's some money um, that I believe... It doesn't doesn't really. I mean, I do humanitarian work and I've, I've had people... I wouldn't say challenge me because they they know what I do, um, uh, but I've had some people saying, "Oh, but you know this this uh, stop giving aid into Africa and and stop uh, giving donations and that." And and I actually stopped the one the one lady and I said, "You're getting this all wrong. Africa needs the help and the support, but not the way that some people are doing it. And yeah. it needs to be governed in a way where it's yeah. not." degrading and 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 a simple silly one is for example sweets these kids don't grow up eating sweets all the time so the sugar that hits their body um if there's too many people that go past the sugar starts eating the teeth because they don't have the same scenarios than what we do and and it's a silly example but it's a relevant one when it comes to support in what these kids need i obviously give um, uh, um, I, I, I glasses to kids because it helps them em- and, and it empowers them to do things and have an equal chance where, where, where other um, kids or, or parents don't have. And I think it's, you know, to me, it's important. It's not the end and be all, 
but it's very, very important. My family is way much more important than this. But I just, I have a huge stance exactly where you are, where don't just rush off and give. Understand community. Uh, know what you're dealing with. Recognize that you're in a rural area in the middle of Botswana. Throwing sweets out of a window is not appealing at all. Um and they don't. They then throw the packet nope. not in the bin. They throw the packet, uh, the wrapper somewhere else. You know, and it blows around and it creates. Anyway, so we're getting way off, off the subject. Let's 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 change this up yeah. a bit. So, what fridge do you have in your in your camper? What size uh, yeah. fridge is it? It's a National Luna. It's a big size. It's an old one. It came with the car when I bought it. So I think okay. it's at least. 15 years old, um, but it's yeah quite a substantial uh, size actually, uh, fridge freezer combination. Um, so yeah, it's it's working. I've it stopped working several times, but uh, you'll find some guy in in Arusha in Lilongwe that will fix it and bypass the thermostat and put an extra <laughs> button on it and it works again. <laughs> so um, yeah. I actually ordered ordered all the parts from South Africa, spending a lot of money, and then it finally arrived by DHL. And this guy, he just bypassed that whole system with uh, yes. his African way of mechanics, and it works for. A, 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 I, I haven't even used that new thermostat. It was a wow. loss, total waste of my money, actually. Um, so. Luckily, he fixed it. Some other things need original parts, obviously. But, um, yeah, I've got a, the comfort of cold um, storage. Okay. And uh, then um, and uh, drinks, tires. What are you running on the tires at the moment? They look pretty, they, they look pretty standard. They, they look quite big, actually. What are they? They... Um, they, at the moment, are a mix of different brands. Um because um, it's difficult to find the. I used to uh, have BF Goodrich and Cooper tires on previous vehicles, uh, which were built for like, let's go yes. off-roading, let's take different tracks and go for the challenge. Uh, this, this is my house. This is all I have. I don't have a home anymore to return to. Um, often people ask me, so when are yeah, you going yeah. home? And I'm like, but I am home. Uh, this, this is my home wherever I, I'm at. But um the tires, um, yeah, are difficult to come by in this part of Africa, and they're very expensive. So you need to go to big cities to find diversity. So at the moment, I've got, I think, four different brands, four different tires patched up on the inside with glue and patches. I'm actually in need of some uh, some good tires whenever I get to uh, to Kampala. Uh, and that offers me the choice yes, of yes. finding no, the best it's, it's, tires. Uh, and, and I think uh, for you, you don't need that really hardcore mud terrains. I think a, a decent all terrain would be nice, but even still, you know, you're not exactly going uh, yeah. crazy off roading. Is is the vehicle four by four, or is it a two by four? Yeah, no, it's four by four. Um, one of the things, one of the gadgets that I really am happy I invested in. I've got an ARB okay. compressor built into the engine bay, so um, I can pump my own tires. Um, I can uh, use it to blow out little parts if I'm fixing things, to get dust out of it, even to clean your car from the inside with all the dust. Um, and that was quite a yeah an expensive investment. Uh, I think it was about seven eight thousand rand, if I recall. Uh, properly, but um, it was very, very worth it to have my own compressor and yes. not some little hand pump or foot pump, but just to get off sandy roads where I drop my tire pressure, obviously, and to get back to tarmac and to pump my tires comfortably uh, to help other people on the side of the road sometimes when they have a flat tire. Um, yeah, that's um, a gadget I would yeah, strongly yeah, recommend. Yeah, I do agree. And uh, I mean, not not only does it serve your tires, but the roads too, especially on the dirt roads when they when they when they're too hard. So, so tell me, and I, I, I could carry on talking to you for like the next hour, but I think we need to try and square off here. Tell me, um, what? That's all right. What is your 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 best item that you use? On in or on your vehicle? What is like the, the one that you like 
that you go besides the compressor, unless it is the compressor, that you would go, this for me is would makes makes everything better? Well, it's a difficult question to answer, but it comes down to actually a couple of more things that don't belong to the car, but uh, a good head torch that you can use both your hands is invaluable to me. A good leather man to have next to all your tools in your whole toolbox, but just a leather man to have with you for immediate small bits and pieces. I think those are the best things that I can, uh, I, I wouldn't want to go without. Um, and the rest, yes. you can always make a plan and find it somewhere. Um, but yeah, for the car, I, I think the compressor is a big, big win. I've had many moments that I feel like, oh, I'm so happy I have that thing and I can pump my tires and with the slow puncture that I couldn't find where it was yeah. and you yeah. just pump your tire again, you know, no, no rush to find somebody to fix it. I, I, I've driven around for months with the slow puncture. Um, just pumping it every day. A bit. <laughs> that would so, grind me. Um, I couldn't do that. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not that 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 relaxed. I would. Uh, I would definitely need to have it sorted out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what is the difference really? It's only in your mind that it makes a difference because the car still yes. drives if you pump it every day. So effect effectively, the reality is still the same. It's just what you want to get out of it or how you feel comfortable. And I'm. I agree with you, but over the last couple of years, yes. I've learned to let that go because it never works like I want it to work. Um, and I only uh, make things difficult on me. Uh, you get become uh, yeah, challenging to the local community where you want things as you want it. And yeah, to let it go more and more has actually brought me a lot more joy in my, uh, wow. in my journey. And I, tell me, Martin, the, the best and worst moments that you've had um, since you've left SA? I mean, is there, has there been something that stands out where you're going, well, this is a, a, you know, this was an outstanding memory for me, or this was, I wish this day never happened memory for me? Um, let's start with the, the more challenging moments. I guess um, that was in Zimbabwe, Chimani Mani on the east side with the border of Mozambique. Uh, my handbrake wasn't working, um, which is common on these old yeah. uh, Hiluxes. And I just parked it for a moment um, to, uh, and I, I went around the car to get inside on the side to grab something from the back. And that was the moment oh. when my car started rolling. Um, and I was away from the steering wheel or the brakes. And it was a full yeah, ravine, 50 meters, 100 meters down the cliff. So um, that gave me the biggest scare. Luckily, I ran around, jumped in, and while it was creating momentum, flying down the mountain, I oh. braked it just in time. Otherwise, I would have I would have lost it all. Um, so that was uh, uh, one of those moments, and I think one of the highlights was um, in Zimbabwe, Manapuls, where I got um, yeah very close with an elephant. Uh, in a magical way where it came to my car and it sniffed around the car and I was standing inside and maybe 10 centimeters just mosquito mesh separated us and it put up its trunk and it sniffed through the mesh and it smelled me and then it yeah, kindly turned away and walked off. Um, that was quite a special moment that I will never I tell forget. you, elephants are very close to me. I, I love elephants. I, in fact, I love pretty much all the animals, but the the... The tran tranquility of um, of an elephant uh, is just comp it's I I can never ever get tired of it. I mean, I've driven past elephants. I, we had elephants walk past our tent in a, a little a lovely campsite north of my own called Kaza Ikini. Um, it must have been. I mean, how it didn't touch our uh, touch my vehicle, I don't know. But it was that close. Uh, we saw the the spoor prints in the morning. Um, them and baobab trees. I don't know what it is. Baobab trees just completely calm me down. <laughs> it's it's weird. I mean, I, they just yeah. have this mass. I, I don't know if it's if it's because they both have this just complete mass of calmness and tranquility. I don't know what it is, but I I, I firmly believe what you're saying, and I, and I, I just I love what you're doing. If, is there anything that you make that you can 
sell to people? I mean, I see you're doing, a, I think, something on a bit of clothes and a bit of uh, uh, woodwork stuff. Is there anything on the road that uh, if someone was to reach out to you, I don't know, that would like something from Uganda made by you that you could ship out? Or is it, uh, is it more hands-on when it happens? Uh, yeah, I've let go of that a little bit. But another piece of advice, uh, I used to, okay. now it stopped a little bit, but I used to sometimes fly in and out. So I see my children, I've got grown children, one in Holland, one in South Africa. So every three months I would take a break, leave my car somewhere, fly back to South Africa, to Europe. Uh, and then I always considered, where am I going next? So Tanzania is the next country. Cool. So I had stickers uh, designed um, and printed, and I sold them on the road while I was traveling. So you uh, arrive at a lodge, and I show my stickers with uh, I love Botswana yes. or I love Tanzania, whatever. And um, I would exchange that for free stay and, and food at times. Um, so I was always thinking about what can I do on the road to create a little bit of income? Um, instead of just doing carpentry work or maintenance work, but what, what can I offer that is not there? And I, I like my stickers. I like to have a little yeah, souvenir of a place I've been to, and I add them to the collection on my car, which is quite substantial. Um, and these were difficult to find. Everywhere I went, do you have stickers? No, we don't. But you have badges, yes. you have magnets, fridge magnets, you have all kinds of stuff, but you don't have stickers. So there's a little gap in the market that I, I just filled and yeah, up to the easiness of arriving in Arusha, going to the biggest souvenir shop in town. And they bought for a thousand US dollars wow. all the stickers I had. So I, I made $600 yes. in half an hour of work just because I planned for what do they need, yes. what I can provide coming from where I come from. Um, and so I used that throughout the last year's to actually add a little bit of cash to my uh, budget. Uh, and it's very enjoyable. You meet different people. You have a different perspective. You're not the tourist anymore. You actually have Listen, something to offer. Listen, I think you need to revive the sticker business because getting a good sticker is uh, sometimes very hard to find. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. So I designed some awesome ones. and um, But it comes with uh, starting a little website again and doing marketing and that is something at this stage I'm really not too interested in yes. to start a business again. I, f I think I've done that multiple times enough in my life that for now uh, I choose not to uh, do it. But yeah, I've got a nice range of designs that I would even freely want to share with people so they can print well, them themselves. I think what I'll do is I'll chat with you and put that link down below somewhere. And if it's uh, possible, people can just reach out to you um, and ask questions. I've seen those stickers. I think they are fantastic. Um, I definitely would love some some really good ones. So I'm gonna I'm definitely gonna keep in touch and see if there's something that that we can do. But listen, Martin, thank you very very much for this. I'm 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 in awe that you're in Uganda. It's a beautiful country. It's green. It's got amazing wildlife, and the people are are superb. So I think you've built yourself a nice little local community there that that trust you and vice versa. And I think if you uh, if you keep doing what you're doing, I'm, I see great things happening. Well done. Definitely keep in touch and folks uh please follow uh follow his handle i'll put it down below um and uh yeah just enjoy listening to this and uh and let's keep in touch i really appreciate it much thanks very much man <laughs>